everybody, and welcome to episode 22, the Mike Bossy episode of Angles and Attitudes. He's John, I'm Mark, and today we are honored to be joined by former NHLer and more importantly, all-time leading scorer in the WHA, Andre Lacroix. Andre, thanks for joining us and welcome. Thank you, Mark. My pleasure. Good evening, Andre. John, nice talking to you. Yeah. Hey, all right, we're going to start. We're going back to, um, we were, you know, reading the, the reading some of the book. And one of the stories that got me, first of all, being one of 14. Um, and the other one, I'll just say my uh, envy, right, John, of being able to skate for a half hour when you went home for lunch from school. Yep. Well, you know, I'm seven boys, seven girls. And I'm the baby, and I'm 20. My, the oldest is, was 20 years older than I am, and uh, I grew up in a small town outside of Quebec, and I'm very proud of that, Lausanne, about 17,000 people, and uh, everybody knew everybody, and uh, we never went inside the house except for the meals. We stayed outside and played sports, and. I put in the book, one of the things that I, I, I always loved hockey for some reason. There's no doubt I, I put in the book and I said all the time, God gave me a talent because there are a lot of things I was doing that you can't teach. You either have it or you don't. And the school was about five minute, five, seven minute walk from my house. I, I was taught by brothers. We built a home, we built an NHL rink in the winter outdoor. Never played indoor hockey till I was 13 years old. And everybody went home for lunch. And I remember going home for lunch and everybody up to eat, put my skates on and carry my shoes in my hands. And sometimes I could skate. Most of the time I had to walk. There was so much snow on the sidewalk. And as soon as I got to the school, wow. I put my shoes inside and I went on the ice and I was the only one on the ice. I brought a stick and I skated for about half an hour. And school was over like at 4.10. And after that, after school, I did the same thing. I went back on the ice for about half an hour because we had dinner at five o'clock at home and I went home for dinner. And then there was a public rink down the street from me. And they used to charge like 50 cents to skates. Wow. And I went to see the guy that was running the rink and I asked him, I said, you need someone to shovel the snow. There was no Zamboni then. It's an outdoor rink. So I said, if I help you shovel the snow, would you let me skate for free? Mm -hmm. He said, sure. They're always looking for help. So I used to help them shovel the snow on the, on the rink, and I skate for free. So the passion starts early with you, Andre, for this great game. Oh, it's, to me, uh, I always had a love for the game. I, I watched the game on TV. But when I watched the game on TV, John, I, watched, I didn't watch the game. I, for some reason, I always liked to play center because I like to handle the puck and I like to make plays. And when I was watching the game, I was watching Monday, uh, Wednesday night and Saturday night hockey night in Canada. And my idols were John Bellavoy and Henry Richard. Oh. And the reason I like Henry Richard because we're the same size. And the reason I like John Bellavoy because he was the nicest man in the world, the nicest man in the world. And, um, so when I was watching the game, I was watching these guys and Rob Backstrom as well, because I want to see what they were doing and maybe I could learn something from them. So I was watching the game a different way than other people. And when I was 12, 13 years old, if we had a game on Sunday afternoon, for example, I only watched like two pairs. I went to bed because I figured I need my sleep for my game the next day. Uh, there you go. Wow. Well, you talk about, in the in the book, you also in 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 some of the interviews, I get two parts. Number one, you mentioned uh, Mr. Bellavo. You played for the Quebec Aces. Was that the senior team that he played for before going to play for the Canadians? Yeah, he played for the senior team. I played for the American Hockey League team. Oh, okay. In those days, Quebec was the only team in Canada, the American Hockey League team, and the six NHL team, their farm teams were the American Hockey League team. And when I played with Quebec. Uh, the, we were kind of a farm team of the Canadians. Every time the Canadians did their tryout, at the end of the tryout, they would send the players that didn't make it. That's where Red Berenson started with the Quebec Aces. They sent them because 
They had John Beliveau and Libby Richard, Ralph Backstrom, and Donnie Marshall. He couldn't make the team. So he, he could have played for Boston or New York because they were the two worst team then. But Montreal owned them. And when ah. in those days, when they owned you, you couldn't go anywhere else. You were done. There was no free agency of moving around like today, right? Oh, my gosh, no. I mean, I remember when I was playing with junior Canadians, I was playing with Cornoyer, Savard, Lemaire, all these guys. We had a great team. I played for them for one year. And the second year, I didn't play for them because Sammy Pollock was a general manager at the time of the Canadians and the junior Canadians. And he called me in the office after the, season, after the first year I was there. And he won me. In those days, you, you had to sign a C form. They call it the C form. The C form meant that you, they, you signed the form and they give you like $500 or $1,000 and you, they own you for the rest of your life. That's how Bobby Orr ended up in Boston because he was playing in Oshawa and he signed a C form with, with Boston and Boston owned his rights for the rest of his life. So I said, I'm not signing this. <laughs> for some reason, I just didn't want to sign it. So the next year, I was not invited to the Canadian, junior Canadian training camp. And that's the best thing that happened to me because I ended up going to Peterborough where I played two years there. And I won the Red Tilson Trophy two years in a row as a more MVP for two years. The first year I beat Bobby Orr. The second year I beat Bobby Orr and Jacques Lemaire. And I tell people the reason I beat Bobby Orr because Bobby was two years younger than I was, <laughs> you know? And I said, I learned how to speak English in Peterborough. I was 16 years old. I can speak English. So in a way, Montreal did me a favor without knowing it. There you go. So one of the things you talked about earlier on about being a center that, I, that caught my attention was not only having plan B, part plan A, but having plan B and having plan C. Is that, you know, you talk about skills, talent, and luck. Is that something you're just born with or could you help a kid cultivate being, you know, like you being the assist guy or Gretzky seeing the play and being there two steps before everybody else is? That's a very good, very good statement. And you did your homework, by the way, because I'll tell you. Thank you. When, no, you did. Because when I say I had always a plan B as a center, when I had the puck, I used to tell both my wingers, you stay open, I'll get you the puck. And at that time, I would look at my left winger, and I, when I was looking at my left winger, I knew where my right winger was in case plan A didn't work, then plan B was my right winger, or vice versa. So I believe it's like we were talking earlier in the show. It's something that you either have it, nobody teach you that, you know, and Gretzky and I played the same type of game. We knew where, I knew where my four teammates were on the ice the whole time I was on the ice. I knew if I had to give the puck to the defense or forward. And also, I think the other thing is that I, they, the puck moves so fast. You, don't, you only have a couple seconds to make a play. And I, the best coach I ever had in hockey was in junior B in Quebec City. The reason I say, Adjut Arcote was my best coach because he taught me how to stick handle. He taught me how to check. He taught me how to take a check. And the way he taught me how to stick handle, he would come on the ice and practice with me, and he would put a bandage over my eyes. Yeah, and he said, I'll give you a puck now. I'll touch the puck with your stick and skate around and said, I'll tell you when you're near the boards. And he said, just stick handle the whole time. And that's how I learned how to stick handle. And then a lot of times, when I was, even when I was in school, when I went to skate in the afternoon by myself at lunchtime, when I bought the puck, I didn't bring the puck just to fool around. I bought the puck to stick handle and put a net there and shoot the puck. When I shot the puck, I shot the puck for a purpose. I just didn't shoot the puck in the net. I had a purpose for it. And that, those are the kind of things that I really believe God gave me that talent because otherwise, you know, I, everybody told me I was too small to play hockey. I was 5'8", 165 pounds. It and truly... I said, I, it's truly uh, that word magician now. I know where it comes from because how you sharpen your senses and your skills just right. by doing some of these things that you have mentioned. Now well, I know where this, this nickname was personal best for you. Yeah, but John, you know what I did too? And I learned on my own. I tell people, I said, the best sport for a hockey player is tennis. 
And the reason I say it's tennis is because it's all eye and end coordination. In hockey, you have to put the puck where there's nobody there. In tennis, you beat the guy by where he's not. And in tennis, you have to move forward, backward, sideways. And it's not, a, I, I tell people, I said, tennis is not how hard you hit the ball. It's where you put the ball. And I say, tennis, I played a lot of tennis as a kid without knowing it was going to be good for hockey because at the school, we had a hardcore tennis. And I, the only thing you need a pair of sneakers. And I used to tell, ask a friend of mine, let's go play some tennis. Let's go have fun, you know. And after that, I realized our oh, tennis was good for my hockey skills. But you wow. must, with those type of skills, you know, you mentioned to the how kids don't, I mean, John and I were just on the tail of an end in our late 50s and early 60s playing outside, right. learning how to play outside, trying out for some of our first teams. And, and you talk about shooting a puck with a purpose. And then obviously you're not shooting, you're not stick handling on the ice kids stick handle on now. So that was another challenge that you had to overcome. But it's got to drive you crazy to walk out and see a kid in one of your camps or at practice with a $300 stick, making noise, click clacking the puck, smacking it. And then what does he do? He shoots it off the glass. You couldn't shoot it off the glass if you were outside, right? You would well, lose the puck in the snow, right? You know, Mark, I played with a straight blade all my life. There was no curve in my stick. And you know, the, the team provides you with the stick. You order like two, three dozen at, at a time. And then you fill the stick to make sure there's a good feel for it. And we used to go to the company and they would make the stick the way we liked them. But my stick was so straight that some of the stick that I received from the factory, they were bending to the right a little bit. That's how straight my stick was. Yeah. And I tell people, I said, the worst thing you can do is to play hockey year round. That's the worst thing you can do. I said, my season was from December until March, mid-March. Mm -hmm. I was so happy when we started and I was so happy when we were done because I could play other sports with my friends. Beside that, when you get back in December, you look forward to come back, you're anxious, you take advantage of every occasion you have because you know you don't have much time to play. I say, every time you play hockey year round, the only thing you're doing, you're working on your mistake. That's all you're doing. Mark and Andre, I would like to maybe switch gears a little bit. Sure. Uh, Andre, uh, tell me about those early Philadelphia years when you come into that new expansion team. And basically, those were those first years when I saw you uh, with guys like Jen Drin and, of course, Simon Ole yeah. and yourself. Um, take us through that, because you were, for me, an instant star in Philadelphia. Well, you know, the toughest decision I had to make in hockey was with the Flyers. When I was playing with Quebec Aces, the year I moved with the Flyers in 67, I was playing with the Quebec Aces. I was leading the league in scoring by about 30 points with like 18 games to go in the season. I had six hat tricks. I, I tied the record for most hat trick in a season. I was going for the record seven hat tricks. I get a call from Bud Poyle in Philadelphia. Lou and Gotti was hurt. I think somebody else was hurt. They said, we want you to come to play a weekend game with us in Pitt this weekend. I said, okay. I go and I meet them in Pittsburgh. That was Saturday night in Pittsburgh. We tied the game 1-1 and I scored the goal on a breakaway. My first game in NHL, I scored my first goal on a breakaway. The next night we come back to Philadelphia. We play Minnesota. We beat Minnesota 7-4. Dale Rochefort was my right winger. He scored three goals. I have one goal, three assists. They named me first out of the game. And then the next day, I go see Bud Poy with my bag ready to go back to Quebec. And he says to me, he says, uh, you decide what you want to do. You decide if you want to stay here or you want to go back. And at the time, I had mixed emotions. First, I didn't have much time to think about it. And I wish he would have made the decision for me. But I said to myself, any kid that wants to play hockey, you don't want to play in the minors. You want to play in the NHL. And I knew that the Flyers had 17 games to go in the season. And they were fighting for first place with St. Louis at the time. I said, the experience I could get with the Flyers the, at the end of the season, you can buy that. That would really help me for next season. But at the same time, in Quebec, I had a chance to win the scoring title. 
I had a chance for the team. We had a chance for the team to win the cup. And I said, the other thing is the booster club in Quebec had given me a car in Quebec city, but the car they didn't give it to me until I was with the flyers because they thought I was coming back to Quebec. And then when I went to the flyers in six, seven, that's when the roof collapsed. Oh, and, yes. we had to, and we had to play a game in Quebec city and Toronto and New York. And when I went to Quebec to play a game with the flyers, that's when they gave me the car on the ice with the Flyers uniform on. Wow. And I said, that to me, that was the toughest decision I ever had to make in hockey. Yeah, but that, that, those good years. I mean, in those days, when I was with the three years I was with the Flyers, I led the team in scoring and I had like about 56 points because we, in those days, if you score 20 goals, it's like you score 40 today. But our game with Bernie and Dougie and Nat, we were winning like two to one, one nothing, three to two. They were all low scoring game. Was sure. that because the way the game was officiated at that time, you had the red line then, it was a, a rougher game, a more physical game, or, or guys just were able to get away with a lot more stuff? No, I think, I think the reason is because I don't think we had as much experience as the other team because we're an expansion team. And then uh, the guys that we had from the the other NHL team that came to the Flyers to expansion mm -hmm. were like third and fourth line players okay. or fifth or sixth defensemen. So we didn't have the experience that the other teams had. So I don't think the, the, uh, the ref had anything to do. I don't think the physical part had anything to do until the last year when I got traded to Chicago. And then because I, I just thought the experience had more to do than anything else uh, but the, with the other team. Andre, that leads me to the next thing and uh you get traded to chicago and i'll tell you i remember the season very well it was the 71 72 season yeah and i had turned to a friend of mine i think and that was the year i met my partner here mark who's uh, we're doing the podcast with you uh stan makita pitt yep. martin andre lacroix brian campbell campbell and christian bordolo five of the best centers i had saw i said to my friend this team's going to win the Stanley Cup this year. But in my opinion, Mr. Ray did not know how to use Andre well, Lacroix. Well, I, did, I never thought Bill Ray was a good coach, number one. Okay, and what? let's not forget, in Chicago, Bobby Hall was as popular as Michael Jordan was. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that the Blackhawks organization was interested in was for Tony Esposito to get shut out, for Stan to win the scoring title, and for Bobby to score 50 goals. If they all did something good like that, they would get 20,000 people at every game. And that's all they cared about. During the season, we knew we were going to finish in first place by Christmas. When I got to Chicago, the guys, Brian Campbell, Pitt Martin, Stan Makita, they all came to me. They said, you know, Andre, why they brought you here? They brought you here to play with Bobby. And they tried every one of us and that we can play with them. I said... Bobby is one of the greatest players that ever played a game, but he was not my type of winger. He was not the type of player that my style. I said, Ulf Nielsen and Anders Erdberg and Bobby Hall were perfect because the three of them were all over the ice and they could play like that. We had Chico Mackey on the right wing with Chico, his job was to go up and down and be the defensive player. Well, everybody knew I was looking for Bobby. Well, every, everybody I played with in hockey, Simone Olé, Jean-Guy and even in the WHA, they all score at least 20 to 30 goals a year because I fed both players. In Chicago, I didn't have that opportunity because I had to look for Bobby all the time because if Bobby didn't score, the center was the one to get blamed for it. So there was a lot of pressure. So I was not happy at all. I, I wish they would have put me on a different line when I went to Chicago. I think I, I probably had a better chance to succeed, but I was very, very unhappy there. That's an interesting, almost like a curse, like you had mentioned Michael Jordan earlier about a point guard trying to distribute the ball. His first look always had to be to Jordan or your first look has to be to Hall. And if they take that away, now, you know, you're not going to make a play. You're a playmaker. You've got nobody to make the play with. Well, you know, Mark, what, they, what the other team were doing, they were not keeping an eye on Bobby. They were just keeping an eye on me because he knew I was looking for Bobby. 
You're 100% right. Because they say, if we stop Lacroix, all won't get the puck. Yeah. That, that brings up interesting. How long does it take? People don't, I, I think, underestimate the importance of the chemistry between a center and his wings. You know, you listen to some stuff from, uh, from Patrick Kane, whether it's, you know, taking himself off the ice because the D man doesn't make a good pass out that his first pass is to fire it off the glass. And he's just like, I know I'm not going to get the puck in a spot. I got to do anything with I'll wait for the next D pair. Talk to us just a little bit about that chemistry with centers and, and wingers in that. Well, you know, both of you guys, you're asking very good question. Both of you, I'm telling you. No, <laughs> because you, these are questions I would not ask before. And this is very important to be honest with you. And thank the reason you. I say that is because as a center, the key to have a good line is to sit together in the locker room and talk and talk about what you might do. To know what, for example, if I played with Bobby, I knew what Bobby would do and I knew what, uh, I knew what, Chico Mackey would do. I, people ask me all the time, I would say, who were the best when you, you played with? I said, the best left wing I ever played with was Mark Howe. Mark Howe would have been an all of fame at the wing as well as he was on defense. He was unbelievable. And the best white wing I played with was Danny Lawson in Philadelphia. He was not the best player in the league. He scored like 72 goals with me in Philadelphia, I think. But he knew that I used to tell him, Danny, let me have the puck. That's my role. Yeah, he could skate like the wind. And I said, if you open up, you'll get away and you'll get the puck. And he did. So the, the talking between the two wingers at the center is what makes you a good line. It's a, it doesn't matter how many times you practice. If you don't talk, mm -hmm. you're not going to be successful. For sure. Do you feel that uh, when you got to the WHA, did you... Were there some lines that you enjoyed to play with, like just like the one when you were in Philadelphia? What was, you, in your opinion, the best line you were on? I know you were on several teams in the WHA just because of how clubs were getting defunct because of money situations. Right. But I watched you in that 74 series. Uh, and, of course, that was all the All-Stars when you guys right. went up against the Russians. And yep. I think you had a goal and like eight assists. You were phenomenal in that series. And uh, well, just who was your favorite line to be with in the WHA? I would say it was when I was in San Diego and I played with Rick Santos on the left wing and uh, Wayne Rivers on the right side. Because when I was in San Diego, that in 1974 was the best year I ever had in hockey. And the reason I say that is because people ask me all the time, what's, what's the most impressive thing that you've done in hockey? And I said, listen, I won the Red Hill Senate two years in a row. I won the scoring title in the WHA twice. I was the MVP. I said, I, the all-time meeting score. I won the athlete of the year in candle in all sports. I won so many awards, but I said, the most impressive award that I had is 1974. I won the scoring title with 41 goals and 106 assists. Wow. And I said, not the scoring title, the 106 assists. Mm -hmm. To me, I always said as a center, if I could get 100 assists in one season, it's like someone batting 400 in baseball. And I said, the year I got 106 assists, it's like, that's unbelievable. There's only four players in the history of hockey that have had at least 100 assists in one season. Wayne Gretzky, Bobby Orr, Mario Lemieux, and I were the only four that ever had at least 100 assists in one season. So to me, that was the most impressive thing I did in hockey. All right, you guys all go to dinner. Who picks up the tab? Oh, probably Wayne. He's got more money. <laughs> <laughs> he would probably invite take us. us to his... Andre. Andre, you're going to have to invite us. <laughs> he would probably take us to his restaurant so he doesn't have to pay. There you go. Yeah. Hey, um, Philadelphia, the Blazers. Did you play with Derek Sanderson? Oh, sure. Was oh, yeah. he... Was Turk, was he Turk then? Had he started to kind of spin out of control with the, the stress of the amount of money and the big contract and all the publicity? He, he did, but not as bad as later because he, I think, you know, Derek came to Philadelphia for the money, obviously. You know, but Boston wouldn't pay anybody. I mean, they didn't pay anybody. So Derek just couldn't turn the deal down. And then when he came to Philadelphia, that's when Joe Namath was popular in New York. 
And Derek wanted to be the Joe Namath of hockey. So Derek, he came to Philadelphia. He, he leased a Rolls Royce. And the first game in Philadelphia where we didn't, the game was canceled because the Zamboni went on the ice. And as the Zamboni came off the ice, he lifts some of the ice so we could play the game, first game of the season. So they asked Derek to go and talk to the fans to tell them we're sorry. Ta -da -ta. But what happened is before the game, they had given all the fans an orange puck with the Blazers' <laughs> logo on it. I remember so that. instead of giving to them at the end of the game, they gave it to yeah. them at the start of the game. Yeah. And people were throwing pucks at Derek on the ice. <laughs> so we couldn't wait to get up the ice and get into the locker room, okay? And then when Derek left the locker room to get to his car, somebody had put a big scratch on it, uh, on his car. Oh, wow. And we were playing at the Civic Center in Philadelphia, one of the worst areas in Philadelphia. That's where our home games were. So, and Derek was roommate with Pierre Plant, a French kid on the road. And then... Everyone, remember Joey Edgerton, the actress? Yes. What, oh, yes. Okay, well, Derek was dating her at the time. And she would call the room, and here's Pierre Plant, French-Canadian, you know, Joey Edgerton's calling, you know. <laughs> and, and uh, But Derek and I became very good friends. And then eventually, I did color commentary for the Whalers for about eight years. And Derek was doing the same thing with Boston. So every time we went to Boston, he and I would have dinner together. And every time we came to Hartford, would do the same. So Derek was a great guy. And uh, Bobby O was his savior. Bobby O saved his life. Sure, sure. Wow. I mean, and I don't think he even played much going into that uh, shortened Blazers season, correct, Andre? I mean, they let him go, basically. I think they, well, paid him to leave. they paid him to leave. What happened, they did. What happened was we played a game in Cleveland. In Cle and then he got a penalty. And when he got out of the penalty box, instead of going to the door, he went over the boards and he tripped and he said he hurt his back. So he couldn't play. And after a while, the team doctor said, I think you're ready to play. You, you seem fine to me. And Derek said, no, I'm not. <laughs> so I don't, know if, I don't know if Derek wanted to keep playing or not. And then the owner of the team didn't have a clue about hockey. He couldn't figure out, he couldn't figure out why we didn't work nine to five like his truck driver. Mm -hmm. he, he was wondering why we only practice for an hour and a half, then we go home, okay? So, and he was not happy with Derek's lifestyle, mm -hmm. so they decided to buy him out. Yeah, I'm sure he was at Bachelor's Three with Mr. Namath. That's right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Every time you went somewhere on the road, Derek had to buy a, a drink for everybody, you oh, know? Yeah. And, and he wouldn't drink the whole thing. He would drink one. He would go see somebody else, and have you know. Uh, but I'll tell you what: the, the the year we were together in Philadelphia, I didn't see a drinking problem with Derek at all. I did not. I think he's. I think at the time it was overrated, mm -hmm. his situation. I think the fact that he was associated with Joe Namath had more to do than everything else. It was all the publicity. But it played into it played into who he wanted to be to a certain extent, right? Yeah, exactly right, Mark. Concerned. Yes. So it, it, you know, absolutely. You want to be Joe Namath. That's yeah. Right. Not That's a bad true. thing to be, I guess. Oh, listen, Joe Namath was king. I mean, come on, you know. And and Joe so Namath, all the too. girls, he had all the girls he wanted, you know. And Derek wanted to do the same thing. Sure. That lifestyle. Well, the lifestyle does it. John and yep. I are past that, so we're safe from that. Our <laughs> lives don't have to worry. So. <laughs> I'm not there yet. Viola, I'm just for you. That's why you play on Sundays. It's for That's the girls. Right. We exactly. know that now. Yeah, yeah I, get, I get a honey-do list over here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So but, you talked about um, teaching kids now, and the, the, we'll go back and forth a little bit. The game now, as you talk about, guys just want to get a check. And, and that camaraderie that you guys had, where you had to work hard every day to keep your job, where now a guy's looking like, well, I'm free agent at the end of the year. Um, maybe I don't go as hard for fear of getting hurt. I want to sign a big check, and then I'm, I'm squared away. Do you think that that, that – obviously, you think it's it's got a little bit of a negative impact on the game – and it, it changes the way they play the game. You see, I don't watch much hockey anymore, to be honest with you, because of what you just said. 
one of the reasons what you just said. See, the reason I don't watch much hockey is I'm so glad I played when I did, to be honest with you, okay? I mean, after the game, we were trying to figure out where we're going to go. We're going to go to Rexy's in New Jersey, you know, Cherry Hill for a drink. Today, the guys are too young to get into a bar anyway. They can't even get into a bar. They go play video games. Okay. Now, <laughs> the other thing is that I hate the way hockey is played today because it's all dump and chase. It's not hockey. It's not hockey. Okay. The, the only player I watch now is Barzell in, in, with the Islanders. Mm -hmm. What a player. That's the way that the whole game should be played. The way Lemieux played, the way Gretzky played, the way I played, the way Barzell played. You know, but now if you look at hockey and they, they get over the red line, dump it in, next guy gets a puck, gets over the red line, dump it in again. It's boring, really. I think they should bring back the red line, to be honest with you. And the reason I think they should bring back the red line, because then they would have to concentrate on outside and there would be more playmaking, to be honest with you, than there is now. And the game is not as physical as it used to be because the guys are making so much money, they don't want to get hurt. And I think, I'll tell you, I think hockey is in trouble. And the reason I think hockey is in trouble because I'm so happy with the money they're making. But when you get to the point where you, put, you give Seth Jones, for example, the pitch for Columbus last year, when Chicago gave him a contract for $9 million a year for five or six years, are you crazy? Yeah. Okay. So that means look at why Toronto is in trouble. You got four guys that make $10 million each and you can get rid of them. So every team now is playing a lot of guys, a lot of money because there's a salary cap. That's the only good thing with hockey is salary cap because you cannot buy players anymore. You better be careful before you sign somebody. But now the general managers, they don't care. There's under so much pressure. They're going to take a chance to win this year or next year. Mm -hmm. So they pay the guys, they overpay the guys. And let's face it, everybody that gets a six or seven year contract, after three years, they want to unload him. But they cannot unload him because he makes so much money and nobody wants him. So Aki's got a lot of problems because then the, the ticket price goes up. Mm -hmm. And the good fans cannot afford to go to the game anymore. So I think that they need to make some changes in hockey, the way they play the game, because a, a, a hockey fan doesn't enjoy. The last game of the playoff, one nothing game, was that uh, Tampa Bay won against Montreal, was one of the worst games I've seen this year. For a one nothing game. I, and I have to be honest, and, I, and I'm going to direct this question to you and Mark. And I never ask questions to markets. We're the one asking the questions. But parity and these smaller markets, I'm on, I'm in agreement with you, Andre and, and Mark. I just don't see this no. getting any better. No, uh, I think it's going to get worse. Well, beside that, if you look at if you look at they what 35 teams in NHL, I don't know 35, 36 teams, whatever it is. There's really one good goalie in Tampa. That's it. Mm -hmm. Let's face it, Montreal, he played, the goalie played well in the playoff, but during the season, he was number two at some point. He was not number one, okay? Every goalie instructor should be fired <laughs> because they all teach that stupid butterfly, mm -hmm. which doesn't work. Okay, you don't have goalies like Bernie Perron, brother. You don't get goalies like that anymore, Grant Fear. You don't. Because they played the game the way it should be played. They stopped the puck, didn't give much rebound. They couldn't shoot the puck out if they had to. But today, the goalie has to be a third defenseman. That means you don't concentrate as much. You concentrate as much as what you're going to do with the puck as you do stopping the puck. And that's wrong. Well, you look at, and, and a guy like Grant Fear couldn't survive today because of all the analytics. Everybody but, would look at his save percentage and this exactly. and that. Yeah. And if you give up six, but your team scores seven, that they talked about that all the time. Guys don't make the big save. You go up, you score a goal, right. you get to within one, you need a stop to continue the momentum. The guy gives up a goal. He's at 92 on a save percentage, but he gave up a goal in the wrong situation. And, that, right. and then the game gets away from you. Well, the other two, Mark, don't forget, to, if you look at the, uh, the way the game is played, you look at Carter Hart in Philadelphia two years ago, okay? Unbelievable. 
But I always felt when he was doing well in two years ago, I didn't think he was that good because he gambled a lot and the players didn't know him. Last year, they got to know what he was doing and he would do a lot of faking and then he got burned. So I said, everybody, when they say he's going to be the savior, I said, he's not going to be any burn, no burn in Ferrante. It's not going to happen. But I said, all the goalies today, if you look, most of the team, they don't give long-term contract to goal anymore because they know that they're flaky. You might say, look at, what's his name, near me that played for the Blackhawks when he won the cup? Mm -hmm. After he won the cup, they let him go. Yeah, right. Because it was not that good. The team because was good. They're interchangeable. Right. You know, they you, are. you see that in football now. Remember, like, the Walter Payton days, you'd have a running back for six, eight, ten years. Now they get one for two, and they just interchange That's them. That's right. And they'll play, the you know, system. now they play 40 exactly. and 40. Right. Yeah. Good point, so, Mark. Yeah. But, so, but the, the game is built on skating and speed when you bring up, like, Barzell, which, which is amazing to watch him. Even Mitch Marner plays with a certain flair. I don't think he yes, he does the team yet as well as he should. He but, would do better um, on a different team. Well, that was back to your money point. So um, Hyman gets yeah. seven million dollars to skate alongside Connor McDavid now, and he scores twelve to fifteen goals. And there are other guys with twelve to fifteen goals who didn't play for Toronto that are making three. And now Hyman's right. going to make seven to carry the water for Connor McDavid. So right. again, where does that, you know, balance in that regard? Well, you see, that that's a point we're trying to make about the money they make today. Look at the guys that left Tampa after they won the cup. They had to let somebody go, you know, because of the numbers. And I was telling a friend of mine, I said, the way hockey is right now, during the season, your top six forwards on each team are probably equal. Mm -hmm. And that's who's going to win the game for you during the season. In the playoff, your bottom six on each team are the one that's going to win the playoff for you. Okay? That doesn't mean they're worth all kinds of money. It's just that the, good, the top six players don't play with the same intensity in the playoff at the bottom six. That's why the bottom six are better. So if you look at the players that have been signed now from Tampa or other team, they're third and fourth line players. They signed for $4 million, $5 million a year. And they're going to be third line players someplace else as well. But that's a guy like Tyler Johnson. Exactly. To come to Chicago. You know, yep. do you put him, do you play him with Taves or is he your third line center and you get him some power play time? Well, he has to be a third line center and, and play the power play. I agree with you completely. Okay, he's not a first or second line player. So that's the you know, rule. Here's of the thing, but Andre and Mark, it almost comes down to like, and Mark and I have coached at, you know, at the level of uh, high school and travel and that. You're almost, as, you're basically, your team is as good as your worst player. You know, well, how you break down first six and your bottom six. Well, that's why if you look at the, at the general manager now, what they're doing, the, the biggest obstacle that they have is to pick the bottom six players on, the, on their team because they better pick the right guy. Look at what's his name in Tampa that's got three standing cup in a row. You know, you had one. Pat Maroon. Pat right. Maroon. Okay. And he's making now, all kinds of money. Now, <laughs> if you look at him, he's a fourth line player at yeah. best. Uh -huh. Okay. But I want him on my team. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So, that's when the John manager comes into play. And you know if he's a good John manager because you need to look at the personality of the guy. Is he, is he a good teammate? Is he going to bitch if I don't give him a, that much ice time? But this is the bottom six players are going to be the key to your success. Well, look at – so when, when the Hawks were winning, people left Kane alone. You had to find somebody to provide space. That's and right. now Ryan Reeves goes to New York. Why? All of those first round picks and Artemi Panarin need to be able to go and do whatever they want to do, right? That's your exactly. best friend. Mark, when the when after the Pittsburgh Penguins won the cup, okay, a good friend of mine, his name is Larry Gutsakis. He worked for Nesley. Larry is from uh, is from Toronto. His nephew is Steven Stamkos. So Larry and I are very good friends and we talk all the time. And I said to Larry, he's been here for like 10, 11 years or so, and I said, the worst trade that I told him that when Pittsburgh traded Reeves to uh, 
uh, Las Vegas. 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 No, he went to Vegas. Vegas. I said, that's the worst trade they ever made because Crosby was free to do what he wanted because Reeves was on the bench. And I said, you should have never traded him. I tell you, New York can be really good next year because of Reeves because they have a lot of talent, but they couldn't play their style of play because mm -hmm. the people would go and run them over. They're not going to run them anymore. Well, you look at, you know, when the Hawks were winning, Dustin Bufflin, Andrew yeah. Ladd, there was just enough to just let him do his thing and people knew just, and, and that's a whole nother discussion. Well, he about knew his prepare. role, Mark. He knew his role as well. That's See, it. That's and, and he These guys know their role. And, knew, and look at now with social media and everything, um, Maroon's going to make more money off the ice. <laughs> he will. He will. He'll make knucklehead. <laughs> God but bless he, him. God bless him. Right. He embraced his role and he lived in it. So, well, that's why it's good for kids. You see, I wish more people would talk to the kids today and say, don't look at McDavid. Don't look at Barcel. Don't look at, you know, Crosby. Look at the old bottom players. Don't think you're not good enough. To be honest, you could be drafted 120th and make the NHL. If you have the right personality and the right attitude, and if you know your skill, if you don't think you're better than you are, you can make it. That's it. Accepting your role is just absolutely unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, John, I'm going to give you a, a roundup question here because we could just keep going. Oh, for and sure. Going, we'll and and we'll, we'll get you on a calendar for another segment, but this has been phenomenal. But John, I'm going to give you a wrap up. Andre, I have to tell you, this was uh, a great honor coming here on Angles and Attitude tonight. The book, which I have after the second snowfall, as you can see here, I'm holding it up uh, when I got it. And of course, I, like I said, I followed you from the expansion years of the Philadelphia Flyers to our own Chicago Blackhawks, to the WHA in that 74 series and all the teams. And what you're doing right now in Ohio for hockey, this was truly, I mean, reading about you and the nickname is great. I have to tell you one question, but I'm, I hope you can answer it uh, faithfully to me. And then I want to go back to my wrap up. Hardest goalie you ever had to face? For me? Hardest goalie you ever had to face? Jerry Cheevers. Cheevers. Okay. Well, the, re tonight, the, re I, I, I have the to reason you, is tonight is a bittersweet night here doing this interview with you. Um, I don't know if you and Mark know what has just transpired in the last 45 minutes. No. Um, this is very hard for me, but the great Tony Esposito has passed away. Oh, my no. goodness. He just passed away 40 minutes ago at the start of this interview. Tony? People, oh, people were texting me. He has passed away. He was my idol here in Chicago. And, uh, Andre, I have to tell you, thank you. Merci he was beaucoup. so good to me when I was there. Yeah, merci beaucoup, Andre, for coming on Angles and Attitude. But this was a, a night that I'll never forget interviewing you and losing the great Tony Esposito oh tonight. Oh, my goodness. Sorry about oh. that, John. Yeah. And uh, Sorry, I buddy. truly appreciate We want you back on Angles and Attitude. We will, anytime. My I pleasure. Thank you very much. We're going to go have fun. All, we're going to go all WHA next time because I'm sure Whatever the you want to do, unbelievable. Whatever you want to do, I'm with you. All right. I'll, I'll, we'll get you All back right. here thank before you. The, uh, December. Okay, you thank you guys. Thank you. Have a nice night. Sorry about thank that, you. John.